Okay, we're now recording. So I'd like to welcome everyone to this week's Wednesday webinar. I'm Shannon Dill. I'm with University of Maryland Extension. And today we're going to be talking about water and water use in agriculture. I'll be facilitating this session, so any questions that you may have, please use the chat pod or the Q&A, and we can get those to our presenter. The presenter is Rachel Goldstein. Happy to have her here today. Before we get started, we would like to thank our sponsors of the Women in Ag program, as well as the collaborators, and thank them for all of their support. As a reminder, we are recording today, and a link will be sent out following today's session. If you want to look at any of our archived or upcoming webinars, you can look here in the blue link, extension.umd.edu backslash women in ag to find out what's coming up and then previously recorded webinars. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and share Rachel's screen here. And Rachel, you're muted if you want to unmute. I can help you do that. Oh, there okay. we go. Can you hear me, Shannon? Yep, nice and clear, very good. Okay, well, thank you, Shannon, and I'm so happy uh, to be here today virtually with all of you. Um, as Shannon said, I'm Dr. Rachel Goldstein. I'm an assistant research professor at the University of Maryland in College Park. Um, I am in the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources in the Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics, and I'm also in the School of Public Health in the Maryland Institute for Applied Environmental Health. So as Shannon said, today I'll be talking about two of my favorite topics, water and water reuse in agriculture. So to give you an idea about what I'll be talking about, I'll give you a quick introduction to CONSERVE, which is the center of excellence that I work for. And I'll also be going into some background information about different types of water that can be used for agricultural irrigation and water quality aspects of all of those types of water. I'll also talk about why water reuse is so important. Then I'll go into some specifics about water quality research from CONSERVE and then kind of the big picture takeaways, what the implications are for irrigation water use. And then I'll leave you with some resources that we've developed related to water quality and water reuse. So for those of you who have not heard of CONSERVE before, I wanted to give a quick introduction. So CONSERVE is a center of excellence at the nexus of sustainable water reuse, food, and health and we are funded by USDA NIFA. So our mission at CONSERVE is to facilitate the adoption of transformative on-farm treatment solutions that enable the safe use of non-traditional irrigation water on food crops. So one of the things that I've been working on over the past few years is doing communication for CONSERVE. And one thing that I learned is that some of the terms we're using are not very clear. So I want to be really clear about exactly what we're working on. And we noticed that non-traditional water was not a typically recognized term. So it's a term that USDA developed. It's a catch-all term for really anything other than groundwater. This is to emphasize USDA's uh, prioritization of protecting our groundwater resources. So it's a catch-all term. It includes things like agricultural runoff, treated wastewater, recycled water, produced water, untreated surface water, and brackish and groundwater. So in all of those different types of non-traditional water, CONSERVE has been really focused on recycled water. And to be really clear again, when we're talking about recycled water, I mean highly treated municipal wastewater. So CONSERVE's work on non-traditional water and specifically recycled water for agriculture takes a big team. So we have a large transdisciplinary team of researchers and outreach specialists. We're centered at the University of Maryland in College Park, but we have a number of collaborators both in the Mid-Atlantic region and also outside the Mid-Atlantic. So here in the Mid-Atlantic region, we have partners with the University of Delaware, 
at USDA and at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. Uh, then we also have collabor collaborators out in the Southwest. So those are people who are living in an area where they're already using recycled water for agriculture. And then we've also partnered with the leaders in water reuse in the world in Israel. So that's uh, with the Arava Institute, and they're working on both water quality issues, but also, again, this idea of technologies to further improve the quality of recycled water. So now I've told you a little bit about Conserve and that we really think that water reuse in agriculture is important, but I want to give you some more background information about just water quality in general. So to start, I wanted to look at, you know, these typical types of water that can be used for agriculture. First, of course, we have rain. So if you live in a place where you're lucky enough to have predictable and plentiful rain, that could be a great source of water for your agricultural operation. But if you don't, or if you need to supplement, then you turn to an irrigation water source. Typically, this is either groundwater or surface water. So the images that I'm showing now relate to groundwater. And groundwater is exactly what it sounds like. Probably many of you already know this. It's just water that's below the ground. And the great thing about groundwater is because it's often below, these, uh, below the ground in these aquifers, it's protected from surface contamination. So it's often thought of as a very high quality water source. Now on the flip side of that, it can be difficult to actually access that groundwater. And the image on the bottom is showing different aquifers, specifically in the state of Maryland. And you can see that it varies where those aquifers are and how deep they are. So sometimes you might not have a source of groundwater. Sometimes it might be difficult to access that groundwater. So the other type of traditional irrigation water source is surface water. That might be something like the picture I'm showing now. A pond, a creek, a stream, a river, anything that's on the surface. Now, because surface water is on the surface, that means that it is more open to contamination from other things on the surface. So it's a riskier water source. Now, another potential source for agricultural irrigation water is recycled water. That might not be a water source that you've thought of for irrigation, but it could be a source because it goes through a series of advanced treatments. It's highly regulated and it's plentiful. Now, one of the reasons that we're so interested in alternative water sources for agriculture is because of maps like this. So, so this map is showing the state of Maryland almost exactly one year ago from July 17th. And what we're looking at here is that about 40% of Maryland was in abnormally dry conditions. So you might remember that last year, the beginning of July was extremely dry and the second half of July was extremely wet. So we're seeing this issue with variability. But it's important to look not just at one day, but at a longer time period to understand what patterns we're working with. So the map I'm showing now is a map of the entire United States from 1900 to 2016, and it's showing frequency of droughts across the country. I've highlighted the state of Maryland with that red dotted box. And what you can see there is depending on where you live in Maryland, in the past 116 years, there were anywhere from 36 to 46 years of drought. So it's more this pattern of increasing drought. At the same time, though, we're also seeing these extreme precipi precipitation events. So the picture that we're looking at now is a picture of Ellicott City, which had these extreme flash floods, which, which really decimated the city two years in a row. So unfortunately, we don't even need to go back as far as one year. We can look at this picture, which was taken on Monday. Uh, right outside uh, Maryland in D.C. on Canal Road. What we're seeing here is this flash flood. What happens when there is a flash flood or an extreme precipitation event like this is there's so much rain coming down that the ground cannot absorb it fast enough. 
What happens then is that it flows off the surface as runoff and it's picking up any contaminants that are on the surface as it goes. That could be fecal material from wild or domesticated animals. It could be chemicals that are on the roads, especially if, if uh, flash floods like this happen in the winter, we have a lot of road salt, road salt on the roads. It could also be chemicals that are being applied on the farm. All of these different contaminants, which are now in that runoff, are going into our surface water, bodies, our surface water bodies, uh, impacting our water quality. So then when we look at groundwater, which I mentioned has that high water quality, we're also seeing some stresses on groundwater. So this map is from Maryland. This is showing a 15 year period from 2002 to 2016. And this map is showing different groundwater monitoring wells throughout the state. What we saw is during this 15 year period, 56% of those wells saw decreases in groundwater levels. So we're seeing modest declines in groundwater, and some of that is due to increasing population. So a lot of those darker red areas you see are areas that are seeing population growth where domestic uses are stressing our groundwater sources. What that means though, is that there's less groundwater in some places for agricultural uses. This is really emphasizing the need for reliable alternatives. But it's not just reliability that we're concerned about when we talk about water quality. Of course, it's also safety. And this is really what the Food Safety Modernization Act or FISMA is trying to get at. So the goal of FISMA is really to protect our food safety by being proactive, by trying to address possible sources of contamination instead of just reacting when something happens. The way that FISMA is trying to do this is identifying possible sources of contamination on the farm, and that does include water sources. So now we need water sources that are reliable, and we also need water sources that are safe. So let's take a look back at those water sources that we started with, rain. We're seeing increased variability, extreme precipitation events, uh, alternating with increasing drought frequency. When we look at our high quality groundwater, sometimes that groundwater is not accessible or available depending on where you live. And in some places, the levels are declining oftentimes because of domestic stresses. Um, and those domestic uses are getting prioritized. And when we look at surface water, that surface water is just a riskier water source because it's on the surface. So it's more susceptible to contamination. And then we have this other possible tool in your toolbox when you're thinking about irrigation, which is recycled water. The thing about recycled water is it's treated, it's highly treated, it's gone through a series of different treatment processes, it's regulated and it's reliable we will always be producing wastewater and will continue to treat that wastewater. Now at Conserve, we really believe that some of these alternative water sources, including recycled water, could be really important for agricultural irrigation. We acknowledge though that there are a lot of questions that still need to be answered. Some of those questions have to do with how safe recycled water is and how safe is it to use for irrigation on your crops. Now we're addressing that through these five different project areas, which I'm showing you on this screen. So I'll just briefly describe these five different project areas starting on the left in the blue box. So the first objective is to look at both the quantity and the quality of these different non-traditional waters, including recycled water. When we look at objective two, the pink box, that's our societal impacts team. So we have behavioral economists who are really trying to understand what the consumers think about recycled water and would consumers be willing to purchase produce if they knew that it had been irrigated with recycled water. 
We also have a legal and policy team, and these people are looking at the different laws and regulations that vary state by state on how recycled water can be used and what it can be used on. Moving again to the next project area here in the green, Objective 3. So I mentioned that the mission of CONSERVE is to facilitate transformative on-farm treatment solutions. So we're really focused on some of those solutions, and that means creating some new treatment technologies. So we have collaborators at USDA that are developing new treatment technologies that can further improve the quality of recycled water. And then we have other researchers in Arizona who are looking at more traditional water treatment technologies, things like UV radiation and ozone, uh, but applying it specifically to recycled water. Then objective number four in the purple, that's actually the team that I'm the co-project director of. So it is our innovative extension and outreach team. And I've listed a lot of things here about what we work on, but the real goal of my team is to take all of the research that CONSERVE is doing and bring it out to agricultural communities. And then the other half of that is getting feedback and listening to you all, to people who would potentially be using this water and understanding what your needs and concerns are so that we can help address those. Then our last project area, Objective 5, is experiential education. So these are folks who are developing K-12 curriculum, and we're also training undergraduate students and graduate students in different areas related to water reuse. So I've highlighted here the two areas that I'm going to focus on for the rest of the talk. So I'll be talking about the water quality team and the results that they've developed over the past few years. And then I'll also go into some of the resources that our extension team has put together related to water quality. So let's look at some of that water quality research. The objective of the water quality team was to characterize the chemical, microbial, and physical quality of non-traditional irrigation water sources. What this really means is they want to look at all aspects of water quality and try to answer that question, how safe is recycled water compared to other types of water? Now, you can see this table on the left is showing all the different types of water quality parameters that were explored, but I'm only going to focus on the two that are outlined in red here, bacterial indicators and pharmaceuticals and personal care products. So really, uh, the microbial quality and the chemical quality. And when we talk about bacterial indicators, we're talking about bacteria that give us some idea that there could be something in the water that could make people sick. Now, the bacterial indicator that we're most focused on, both for conserve, uh, but also what ISMA is using, is E. coli. And before we get further into looking at the actual results, I wanted to just uh, better explain what E. coli is and put it into perspective. So looking at this image I have here, E. coli is part of this large group of bacteria called total coliforms in that navy blue circle. So total coliforms are indicator bacteria themselves. They give us some idea that there could be some sort of environmental contamination, but they don't tell us where that contamination could be from. A subgroup of intro coliforms are fecal coliforms, and the name kind of gives away what those are used for. So fecal coliforms give us an indication that there could be fecal material species in whatever environmental source we're looking at. So what we're talking about today is water. Now within fecal coliforms, there's another group of bacteria and that's E. coli. So these are the generic E. coli that the FISMA regulations are talking about. So it's a group of bacteria and most of those E. coli, the generic E. coli, are not harmful themselves. They're everywhere in the environment they're everywhere in warm-blooded animals in our GI tracts, including humans. So most of those E. coli do not make people sick. They are an indicator that there could be pathogens, which are bacteria that could make someone sick. 
Now, with N. E. coli, there is that smaller subgroup of pathogenic E. coli. So those are some types of E. coli that can make people sick. And one type of pathogenic E. coli is that type of E. coli that you hear about in the news when there are big outbreaks, and that's E. coli 0157H7. But when FISMA is talking about E. coli, or if you get your water tested and you get results back, the E. coli they're talking about is that bigger group of generic E. coli, which is just an indicator that you need to further explore what's going on and if there could be something to make you sick. Now, when we talk about water quality and water quality results, the units that are used are usually CFU per 100 mils. So I just briefly wanted to touch on what this actually means so that it helps to understand our results better, both what I'm talking about today, but also if you're getting your water tested. So CFU per 100 mils. A CFU really means a colony forming unit. And I've circled here in this picture what one colony forming unit or CFU is. This is a mass of bacterial cells that grows on an auger plate or a petri dish in a lab. It's a way for us to try to count how many bacteria there are. And the 100 mils or 100 milliliters is approximately half a cup. So that gives you some idea of what that means if you're seeing these numbers, like in FISMA, 126 colony forming units per 100 mils. So how did we even go about collecting the water samples to test to get some idea about water quality and conserve? We had people out there on the ground at all of these different types of water bodies, uh, rivers, um, ponds and recycled water sites collecting the water samples on the ground. And over a two year period, we collected over 4,000 water samples. So that's a, a huge amount of work. And we collected at 12 different sites that were supposed to represent these different types of irrigation water sources. We collected samples from pond water, two types of river water, both non-tidal fresh water and also tidal brackish river water. We were at three recycled water sites and then we had one vegetable processing plant. So let's look at some of those results. The first set of results that I'm showing here are from Dr. Shirley McCollis' lab. She's a faculty member at the University of Maryland in the Plant Sciences and Landscape Architecture Department. What we're looking at here is how the E. coli concentrations differed depending on the type of water, but also how E. coli and surface water was impacted by precipitation. So on the top, we have recent precipitation. On the bottom, we have average E. coli concentrations. Now, before we start comparing precipitation with E. coli, I did just want to point out here with these arrows the differences between surface water and recycled water and pond water. So the arrow on the top is pointing to both of our types of river water. Blue is our fresh water, orange is our brackish river water. And you can see that across these two years, these two types of river water had higher levels of E. coli compared to these red lines, which represent recycled water, and our green lines, which represent pond water. And we'll get into that a little bit more on the next slide. But first, I wanted to talk about how precipitation was impacting our E. coli concentration. So if you look with this first spike of precipitation, again, this, one of these extreme precipitation events, seven inches of rain in October 2016. That's on the top. And now, if you look at the bottom graph, you can see a spike in the amount of E. coli that was in those river water samples just a few days later. And we saw this pattern throughout these two years of sampling. So if we move down, we see these couple of days with heavy rain, followed by a spike in E. coli in fresh, uh, freshwater rivers, 
and then a, another spike in the freshwater rivers and the brackish rivers too. And again, we see this just continuing throughout the data, a spike in precipitation followed by a spike in E. coli. Now, if we move to look at all of these sampling dates together and comparing the different types of water more clearly, what we're looking at here is that again, both types of river water had significantly higher concentrations of E. coli than either our recycled water or our pond water. So both recycled water and pond water had lower concentrations of E. coli than the river water. And if we want to compare our water testing results to FISMA standards so that we have some idea of what at least FDA is saying is safe or not safe, out of our 12 sites, only four of our sites actually fell below those FISMA standards. And what you're seeing here are results for each of those 12 sites, and then the horizontal lines across those bars are showing where the FISMA standards are. So the blue line is the geometric mean. Again, that's 126 colony forming units per 100 mils. And the purple line is the STV, the standard threshold value. That's trying to measure variability. And that's the 410 CFU per 100 mil number. Now, if we look at how the different types of water performed compared to FISMA, Let's look first at recycled water. Here we can see that average, the geometric mean of recycled water performed really well. It was below the FISMA standard um, every time. But when we look at our statistical threshold value, there was only one site that met both of those standards. When we, when we look at our pond water, our pond water actually performed really well. And both of our sites where we were sampling pond water fell below those FISMA standards for all of the sampling dates. Now, although recycled water seems really wonderful when we look at it in terms of E. coli, it's not all perfect. So what I'm gonna talk about now are some of the chemicals that are present in not just recycled water, but all of the water types that we sampled, because the fact is that there are chemicals in our water. So this work is coming from Dr. Amir Safkota's lab in the School of Public Health at the University of Maryland. He looked at multiple types of chemicals in all of these different water types. He was looking at herbicides, antibiotics, and then other types of chemicals, including things like caffeine, which just give us an idea that there could be some contamination from human waste. So what he did here is he used non-tidal freshwater as the reference group, and then he compared all of those other types of water to the levels in the freshwater. What we're seeing here is that when we look at recycled water, recycled water actually had significantly higher levels of many of those antibiotics that were tested compared to some of those other surface water bodies. But there's still good news for recycled water, and that's taking us back to that idea of treatment technologies. So one of our other collaborators pictured here, Dr. Manan Sharma at USDA, He's developing one of those new treatment technologies that I've been talking about. What he's working on is a zero valent iron sand filter. So this is a filter that's made from uh, recycled iron shavings mixed with sand. And the results that I'm showing here from his lab is that these zero valent iron or ZVI sand filters are very efficient at removing those antibiotics that we just saw were present in recycled water. So what these graphs are showing is that there's a significant reduction in all of these different types of antibiotics that were identified in recycled water after it goes through this CVI sand filter. So taking all of these results together, I wanted to highlight what I thought were some of the biggest takeaways. One is that it's important to consider 
all water sources on or near your property available for irrigation, things that you might not have thought about before. And also knowing that water quality really can differ between different types of water. So there might be different uses for different water types. And also that there are treatment options. So it doesn't have to be that CVI filter, but there are things that you can do to improve the quality of your water, whatever you're using, whether it be surface water, groundwater, or if you're interested in recycled water. And then I also think that it is important to consider if recycled water could be an option for you. Again, as I said, recycled water is highly treated, it's regulated, and there is a lot of recycled water. So the map that I'm showing here is from uh, one of our collaborators in Conserve, Dr. Masood Nigabanazar. And what he's done is he's located all of the different wastewater treatment plants in the state of Maryland and how much wastewater they produce. So eventually, he's going to have a publicly accessible tool so that you'll be able to go in, put in your zip code, and find where the wastewater treatment plants are that are near you, what the volume of treated water is that they're producing every day, and you can see right then what the quality of that water is. And it's also important to find out how water testing is done and how to interpret those results. This is important if you need to comply with FISMA, but it's also important just to know what the quality of the water is that you're using. Because what we saw in Conserve is that the quality of water varied not just between different types of water, like our river water and our pond water, but even different ponds or rivers or recycled water could differ between different sites. So as part of this work, the extension team of Conserve has developed a number of different outreach materials to try to provide more information about water quality and water reuse. The first that I'm showing is a definition sheet. So we realize that there are so many different terms out there being used, um, and sometimes they differed between different government agencies, between different uh, industry groups, and we wanted to have one place where you could go for all of the different terms being used related to recycled water relevant for agriculture. So that's available on the Conserve website at conservewaterforfood.org on the extension page. Our Arizona team has developed some wonderful learning modules. So these are modules which can walk you through in a lot of detail some of the background for how to better understand water quality, basic water quality, and also basic microbiology. And they now have a number of different lessons that are available on our website. Uh, our collaborators at New Mexico State University have created these two short animations. These are really about how water reuse fits into the bigger water cycle. And then these are brand new videos from the Conserve Extension team. I thought that it was more important to hear from people who are actually using these alternative water sources than just to hear from me all the time. So we created these videos. The video on the top is showing this successful partnership between the Wharton Butler Town Wastewater Treatment Plant on the Eastern Shore in Maryland with a private farmer. And he's using that highly treated recycled water to irrigate his grain crop. And he's had huge success because the fact was that on the fields where he's using that recycled water, there was no alternative water source. So it's allowing him to grow where he wouldn't have been able to grow before. The video on the bottom is looking at harvested rainwater. So this is a collaboration between Hood College in Frederick, Maryland, and the Religious Coalition for Emergency Human Needs. They're collecting rainwater that's coming off of roofs and using it to irrigate vegetable gardens to provide people who otherwise don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Now, the way that Conserve got involved with that is they had reached out to me to ask whether this was a safe water source to irrigate fruits and vegetables. 
And the thing is, there just isn't a lot of information out there in the scientific literature to answer that question. So we actually started a pilot study with them last year and it's ongoing. And my team and I, we are working with Dr. Amy Sapkota's team, the director of Conserve, and we're actually going out there and testing that harvested rainwater as well as the produce being grown with that. But the video gives you some more background on that. And we have a number of different materials that are in development that we hope will be ready soon. So the first listed here is a legal guide to water reuse in Maryland. So this is being developed by Meha Suri and Paul Geringer, both who work for both Conserve as well as the Agricultural uh, Law Education Initiative, ALEI. And what this is gonna be is for anyone who is interested in using recycled water on their farm, it's a step-by-step -step guide of who you need to contact, what permits are required, and really most importantly, explaining that the liability falls on the wastewater treatment plant, not the farmer who's using that recycled water. We also have a number of extension publications that are being um, uh, getting ready right now. One is on consumer perceptions. I was uh, mentioning our behavioral economists and their work with consumers, and soon we'll have a short fact sheet ready that can explain really what do consumers think about produce grown with recycled water. We also have a water testing fact sheet coming out explaining some of those variables that I touched on today, things like precipitation that can impact your water testing results and how to interpret those results. The images that I'm showing on the bottom of the screen are part of our water sampling virtual lab. So the goal of this virtual lab is to show how to properly take water samples for those of you who might need to do this to comply with FISMA regulations. So it walks you through step by step on the computer and then there'll be a separate uh, water testing component to kind of pull back that curtain on what happens when you send the water samples off to the lab. It shows step by step what a lab does, and then it also explains how to interpret your water testing results. Now, this is the, what I'm showing now is something I'm very excited about. We're still developing it, but we will be holding a series of half day water reuse workshops this winter. So sometime in February or March, 2020, we'll have three water reuse workshops, one on the Eastern Shore at the Eastern Shore Hospital Center in Cambridge, one in Southern Maryland at the Charles County Extension Office, and then one in Central Maryland in Frederick County, and that exact location still to be determined. But what we'll be doing at those workshops is expanding on some of the things that I just briefly mentioned today. So we'll get an update on water quality research from the researchers themselves. So Dr. Shirley McAuliffe, Dr. Amy Sapkota, again, the director of Conserve. And then what I'm really excited about is we are going to be able to demonstrate some of those treatment technologies that I mentioned. So we will have Dr. Manan Sharma or someone from his team at these workshops and he will actually bring a small scale ZVI, zero valent iron biosand filter with him so that he can demonstrate how that works and talk about how efficient those really are at removing not just antibiotics, but they've also been efficient at removing E. coli. We'll hear a policy and regulation update, both from our ALEI team, but also we'll have some of the MDE folks there who actually give the water reuse permit so they can tell you in person what that process is like. And then we'll have a panel discussion, bringing all of those different researchers and policymakers together so that you can ask them directly in person questions. I'm really excited about this. We're just kind of um, tightening things up, but please check back on our website, conservewaterforfood.org for more details. And I'll, I have my email address at the end of the presentation you can also reach out to me and I'm, I'm happy to share that as things become more finalized. So I'd like to acknowledge all of the people uh, whose work I included in this presentation at the University of Maryland, the University of Arizona, and New Mexico State University. I'd also like to thank the whole CONSERVE team for their work. 
And I thank all of you for your attention and for, for listening. And this is my contact information um, if you're interested in contacting me after today. Um, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Rachel. That was great. A lot of good comments and information. Uh, if anyone has questions for Rachel, please feel free to add those to the chat pod. We'll wait just a little bit, Rachel, if that's okay. Sure. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.